From France to the world, welcome to the JDC podcast. In this show, we welcome builders, contributors, founders, well, the architects of distributed systems and decentralized finance. I am your host, Sam, and in today's episode, I am with John from Hyperlane, a modular interoperability layer. John, how are you? I'm doing very well, Sam. Sam, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the pleasure is shared. And the typical question that I ask my guests is how they ended up designing such solutions, like you know, it could be layer one, bridging protocols, etc. I've done a little bit of research and uh, I understood or I found out that you, you were actually looking to becoming an astronaut, but now you're building uh, bridges in the interchain. So the, the, semantics, the semantics are the same, but... Uh, what happened? Oh man, <laughs> you you did your homework. Uh, this is a detail not a lot of people know about me. I uh, I did want to be an astronaut as a kid. I wanted to be an astronaut as an adult. I still want to go to space. It's one of those things. Uh, I told my wife on our first date mm-hmm. within like the first ten minutes. I was like, I want to have a lot of influence in the world. I want to be an and I'm and I'm gonna go to space. Uh, so that's why uh, that's why I built Hyperlane mm-hmm. now. But. Uh, I'm hoping that Hyperlane will help me uh, achieve my goals of getting to space. But certainly we've uh, themed everything as in the realm of space, right? Like when we talk about Hyperlane, we talk about this permissionless interoperability layer that is connecting these, you know, chains that are floating through space. And it's trying to create a pathway between them so that people who are on these, like, they, I, I like to think of chains as different sized stars and planets, and they're like, they are kind of like the solar system. And so in that sense, my uh, my love for all things space related is expressed in Hyperlane. We'll talk a lot more about that, but uh, oh man, that was, you caught me up for fear. Uh, okay, and I'll, I'll be curious to know a little bit more about your, your background, especially that that'll be cool for the audience to, to know what was your journey. Uh, before getting started with Hyperlane, what were you doing before? And the whole reflection, the whole thinking process, what led you to actually design Hyperlane? Yeah, oh, having yeah, more context would be nice. Yeah, yeah I, uh, you know, I had uh, quite a riot to get here. Like even when I think back 10 years ago and I'm like looking at my life, it feels pretty crazy. So I've been in crypto now for about uh, six years and we started Hyperlane, I guess now, Almost two years ago, it was uh, the fall of 2021. I got into crypto from a somewhat, you know, I guess at the time, a semi-traditional background. But unlike most people who tend to have engineering backgrounds, I gave up, I, you know, I hung up my coding cleats uh, when I was probably like 14, 15. I grew up in Israel and all the kids thought I was a nerd for, uh, you know, spending too much time on computers. And I re- regret listening to, to them and letting that dissuade me. But I was basically I was a bond trader at Morgan Stanley when I get really into crypto. And uh, a friend from university, one day we're at his brother's birthday party uh, over the weekend. And he's like, John, I'm going to put all of my money into, into specifically into Ethereum. And like, he's a young guy. And he's like about to put a few hundred thousand dollars, all the money he has in the world that I know he's been saving up for a house. And he's like, going to put it into Ethereum. Think it's a bad idea. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. It's a bad idea. I don't know. It's a good idea. And we go right into it. Like we spend the next 40 hours together, we're just hanging out, reading this white paper, change that, that we can change my life. I come back to the trading desk Monday morning and I'm like on another level. I'm just like, guys, you have no idea what's going to happen. We are all going to be out of a job. And it's not because of what you think. It's not because of like trading bots. It's because this thing called it. Ethereum, it's going to like, there's going to be a different financial system built on it. And that was the summer, summerish of 2016. And I'm just like obsessed. So I spend the next six, seven months learning everything I can about crypto. I get my next bonus in early 2017. I build mining rigs, I mean, a terrible idea. Um, but <laughs> I learned a lot about blockchains from operating my little mines. And then the rest of 2017, I'm just relentlessly looking for a job in crypto. And then I found one. I uh, joined this hedge fund in San Francisco called Passport Capital. It's been this macro fund that operated for 20 years at the time. It was really famous for uh, being one of the biggest gainers from the, the 2008 fall. Founder was a real visionary guy and he really wanted to build out a crypto team. And I was the first hire, spent the next two years, give or take there, and then joined uh, Galaxy, Mike Novogratz's firm. Was there for about close to three years, ran the investment team there. 
and had a great time. And now all the while, I'm like super excited about crypto, right? And like I said before, not a super hefty engineering background. And the thing that was super interesting about Ethereum was like, hey, this is this really cool internet computer and anyone can use it and no one can stop you. Like you can just use it. It's permissionless, the coolest thing in the world. And then I found out that there's going to be these other internet computers and that they can't talk to each other. And I remember thinking in 2017, this thing is like, it's a year away. It's just where in a year, this won't be an issue. And I was thinking back to like being a kid in Israel in the, in the mid nineties. And when I first got an internet connection, it's probably 95, 96, not all of our uh, friends and family who were on different ISPs could communicate. Like some of our email addresses didn't click like, and just think like by, by the next year, this wasn't an issue anymore. So interoperability for blockchain seemed like this is going to, just be a simple, simple thing. Now, I didn't appreciate the technical reasons for why that's such a problem. And throughout my time in crypto, both as an, an investor, someone working very closely with companies, either at a board level, like sometimes just as a sidekick, kept thinking this is just seems like this is not getting solved. By 2020, we started seeing like first inklings of solutions for it, but I didn't really like them. I, it felt to me like we were making the process even more difficult just like to, to solve kind of like a approximate problem that trading firms had. And I think that's why some of the first bridging, bridging solutions came from trading firms. And then just, okay, I kept thinking about Indrop really for such a long time that when the opportunity came to start working on this in late 2021, it's like, there's nothing else I'm going to do with my life. Like I gotta, I gotta try and make this thing work. And one thing led to another, and now I'm working on this thing called Hyperlane. <laughs> Super cool. And I know that you like to go through the history of like the evolution of approaches when it comes to actually bridging or you know having a message passing from chain A to chain B. I think that we'll probably go through that history again. But what would be interesting to introduce here is, yeah, Hyperlane. What is it at a high level? Yeah, we'd we'll be very curious to know more about that. Of course. So at a high level, all Hyperlane is, it's a permissionless interoperability layer. And if you're sitting at home and you're like, what, what does that mean? All it should mean to you is this is the thing that lets anybody, whether you are the creator of a chain, whether you are just some application developer that wants to connect with another chain, whether you are just some like friendly, you know, friendly person with an interest, you can connect any chain with Hyperlane. This is what permissionless means. It means not me. Not anyone on the Hyperlane core team, not anyone, there, there are multiple companies that are working on Hyperlane. No one can actually stop you from using it to connect between different blockchains. That's like the key thing about it. That's what makes it interesting. That's why I'm excited about working on it. That's what uh, is the most important thing to me when it comes to it. Now, what allows it to be that way? Unlike other interoperability protocols, Hyperlane brings uh, a modular uh, security stack and this the security stack is very different, again, from the other players in the field, in which usually people, uh, and in crypto, it's very important to design very, very secure systems. It's a very adversarial world, right? Like in crypto, you make one mistake and you, you know, as, a, as an engineer building a system, and suddenly people are out nine figures, you know, it's not like an Amazon or Google where you make a small mistake and like, a, you know, the checkout button doesn't work or like the, I can't like a video on YouTube. You know, make a small mistake in crypto and someone loses $300 million. Whoa, that is that is very serious. So people take security very seriously and they spend a lot of time thinking about it. And once they've figured out something, they're like, we've spent so much time figuring it out and we're just going to make sure that this model secures everything in our system all the time, no matter what users are doing. Uh, we don't think that we're so smart. We know that at some point, someone is going to break whatever we think is the best thing. Someone will find a way around it. And so we wanted to have a security system where you can bring different options of security and use those different options, different modules at different times based on what users are doing. And I can give you some you know, examples uh, if we want to get deeper into the security side of things. Okay, so two main takeaways here, two points that, that stand out. So it's permissionless at the highest level in the sense that I deploy my own rollup or my own execution environment, you as Hyper, Hyper Lane Labs or Abacus Works or something like that, have That's right. some kind of pre-made solutions or Rust templates or Solidity templates that I can deploy myself to disenclave my chain or my system from, from, from itself. And I can do that in a permissionless fashion while in other solutions that we have on the market at the moment, it is actually bound to governance. Shall we deploy that contract on that new EVM chain? Okay, then we're going to go through an update. There needs to be a vote. And it's still pretty much like 
the impulse comes from the foundation and certain validators to decide whether we should expand to another chain. And that, of course, comes with, yeah, we're expanding the risk in the sense that even though the contract might be similar and go through a similar execution environment, it still needs to be audited multiple times. And that's still a new honeypot or a new contract that could potentially be exploited should the architecture actually involve honeypots. So that's the main thing that I see. I can just deploy Hyperlane on whatever environment that I want and have the possibility to send payloads or assets from my chain to the broader crypto world, let's call it this way. Then you mentioned about this customizable, let's say security logic. So there's a, there's a base layer that I can totally be satisfied with, but if that's not enough for me, I can add uh, extra conditions and mechanisms for the actual message passing to happen if I'm not satisfied with the, the base formula. So it's not a one size fits all approach, but instead I have the, the freedom to adjust the security parameters. Uh, That's exactly right. That's right. Uh, okay. to, to, so to the first part, exactly like you said, you create you know, a new execution environment, a new rollup, a new chain, or maybe you didn't even create one. Someone else is creating one and you want to be connected with Hyperlane, with open sourced all the relevant parts of the protocol. So from the main set of contracts, this is the mailbox contract. It does exactly what it sounds like, right? Like mailbox, it sends and receives stuff. You put yep. the mail in it when you want to send it. That's where mail that you receive arrives at. And then the, the security modules, those contracts, open source, everything you need to run the, the main modules. And then the third part, the relayer, this is pretty simple, like off-chain bot that looks at the mailbox and says, hey, Either you've got mail and here's how to take it, or you're sending mail and let me go take it to its destination. Uh, all of that is open source. You can put that wherever you want. You can run that relayer and now no one can stop you. And you have an interoperability channel between anywhere where Hyperlane exists that you're interested in connecting with. And again, that second part, yeah, like you said, customizable security logic. And the, the way I really like to think about this, this is, uh, we didn't go over this in the background part, but I, I hate the banks. But there's one thing the banks do that I appreciate, even though in the moment it annoys me every time. Uh, if I go to the bank and I try to get, say, $100 out, they will just say, okay, John, put in your card, your PIN number, and then you can get the money. And that's reasonable. It's very fast. If I try to send out $10,000, now they start asking a lot of questions. They say, okay, first I need your card, I need your PIN number, then I need your identification card. Then, what's the name on the account? What's the number on the account? What's your street address? What's your date of birth? Do you recognize the last five transactions? Is there a frequent depositor into your account? Like do you, when you receive salary from a company, what's the name of that company? What's the bank doing? They're saying, you try, you're trying to do two things. Those two things are very different. And when you do those very different things, I want to use a different protocol. I want to use a different security method. And it's a little bit more annoying, right? Like I would much rather just withdraw because like I know that I am me, but because this keeps us safe from money being stolen out of our accounts, I think most people are fine with this idea that the bank treats an action to take out $100 fundamentally different than taking out $10,000 or more. And if I try and close the account and withdraw all the money, like forget about it, right? I'm not getting out of there in that same day. And so that is kind of what our modular security stack lets you do. You have different logic and you can use that different logic at different in, um, in a different way based on what users are using with your app or with your chain. Yeah, it's you could think of it as a way to improve UX by having different challenge periods uh, depending on the amounts that yeah you you're trying to to exchange. So if it's a one million dollar withdrawal, maybe like it gets frozen for three hours for eventual watched hours to challenge the actual withdrawal or something like that. But if it's just like twenty pennies, it immediately confirms and it goes from chain A to chain B pretty fast. So um, I think that yeah, these improvements are definitely exciting. Like they're they're interesting to to implement. One thing that I want to, to get back to is the actual architecture. Uh, so you mentioned that you have these uh, mailboxes. So these are contracts that exist on any any chains that you want to deploy them on. These contracts can be called by any other DeFi contract or any application that sits on these chains. And then you have relayers uh, that will check these outbox and inboxes. And I suppose that uh, they have to run RPCs of the target chain and the origin chain to check what's going on. And they make sure that the message goes from, from chain A to chain B. That, that's right? That's exactly right. Uh, if you want, actually, let's go do a quick kind of architectural overview and we'll try to keep okay. it uh, simple. And if, again, if I 
go too complicated, you let me know, but I want to make sure that everyone can follow this. So there are three main levels to uh, the operating and running Hyperlane. And anyone who uh, implements these three can use Hyperlane to have interoperability with any chain. So the first part is, like you said, there's the mailbox. The mailbox just it's, it's one contract that goes on the chain, and there are some gas management contracts that go around it that you can implement. These will help you make sure that people are paying the right amount of gas for their transactions. But to be honest, we've had a bunch of people implement Hyperlane, some of them more loose with gas. They don't want to necessarily use the gas management contracts, but that's okay. Second is the security modules. So think of the Hyperlane security modules, we call them interchain security modules. Really, all they are is a set of logic uh, that makes you comfortable with the information you're receiving from another chain. And so this can take the form of, you might have some validators that are putting money on the line and you know, so putting up a stake. And if they're lying to you, you can use a, a fraud proof to demonstrate, hey, these guys are lying, take their money away, such that there's always a cost to a validator lying. You can have an optimistic module, kind of like you described earlier, where we put a time delay and during that time, someone can run a watchtower and see, hey, does everything look uh, okay here? If things look okay, at the end of that time limit, that transaction can be processed. And if not, someone can submit a fraud proof, transaction is blocked. There's also um, what I think would be interesting is having a type of like security council thing where it's not just transactions that are invalid by their construction, but also transactions that are malicious. Because if you actually look at almost, almost every exploit that concerns interoperability, is a valid transaction in like the blockchain sense. You know, they're not fooling the chain. They're just fooling the protocols. And so fraud proofs would not stop those things from happening. Uh, and almost a no like interoperability related exploit. But at the same time, say you had something that said these, a transaction above $10 million can't be processed. It, it, ha it takes eight hours. During that eight hours, people could look and see, wait a second, someone's trying to, what's going on here? You know, we see these, crypto and crypto Twitter sleuths all the time. And someone can alert and just say, wait a second, it's pretty clear someone is exploiting the protocol here. And then maybe there's a, a set of, you know, protocol delegates that are allowed to uh, block a transaction, like, you know, security council model. I think that is a very interesting uh, module. Uh, and finally, it could be even super simplistic. It could just be like some multi-sig where you're like, hey, unless these people sign, like that transaction is not included. So all of uh, all these security modules, you know, they can be very fancy, like they could just be a ZK proving system, or they could be as simple as like, it's it's a multi-sig and the multi-sig said that this transaction is okay. So that's the second level. The third is the relayer. And like you said, you explained it perfectly. It's just about and it uh, to operate, to read and to read the mailbox on the chains that it's connecting. It of course needs RPC access. This can be from a node that you're running yourself if it's your chain, or it could be for, you know some of our relayer runners use the RPC service providers. Sometimes, again, it's the chain operators or roll-up operators themselves, and so they have the best RPC available for uh, for their own chain. But if you have those, that, that's, a, that's how Hyperlane works. Someone integrates with the mailbox. The mailbox has a dispatch function. That's how you send things to other chains. The payload that you send there can uh, have information about a movement of assets, a minting of assets, or it can just call a function on another contract on another chain. Maybe it's a, uh, hey, withdraw some ETH based on uh, collateral deposited here on Polygon. But hopefully that's like decent enough and not too in the weeds overview of how it works. No, no, that's great. It seems that we're slowly but surely going towards uh, the standardization of the, of the transport layer or, you know, we hear a lot about IBC becoming uh, one of the main frameworks to enable chains to communicate with each other because it is battle tested to some extent, light client bridges are great. And now we're trying to, I don't know, prove tendermint on Ethereum chains or other systems. And we're just trying to expand it beyond the frontier. Of so I think that that is great. There's all, there are also other approaches like XCMP and, and other frameworks and systems that are being proposed. I would like to know where Hyperlane would sit in the current landscape of, of this system, because by design, by default, you can just have that uh, single, you, you know, you can rely on a set of uh, validators and relayers mm -hmm. that determine whether something should go from chain A to chain B. But my, my main question, and it might sound absurd, is are there ways to compromise that whole pile of security measures that you can add that 
just all depend from a, a consensus attack or something that just sits below all these extra conditions that you're actually adding to ensure the security of the, of the message passing from chain A to chain B. Yes, so let's start with the most fun part of the question. Yes. Can it be compromised? And the answer is absolutely yes. And now that is what I'll say is actually, um, this is something that gets glossed over in the conversation about all of these protocols and pretty much everything can be exploited if you are, um, if you can basically manipulate the state in one of the chains that you're connecting, no interoperability protocol in the world can save you from that. And so whether it's something as pristine as light client verification, which you can get with uh, IBC, this is something that you'll also be able to get with some of the ZK based systems once they are more mature. If you know, so all they're doing is just they ensure that you don't need to trust anything other than the chain you're connecting and the chain you're sending to. But if something is wrong there, you're out of luck. Uh, and this gets glossed out. A lot of people talk about these systems as if they're magic, but there is no magic. You know, the, uh, if if the thing that you're connecting is rotten, you are out of luck. And this is why people like, you know, great thinkers like Vitalik are still very skeptical of this idea where you will be connecting chains that do not have a unified uh, security source. And in that sense, you know, who am I to disagree with Vitalik? But I certainly disagree with him because I think the proof is in the pudding. People want to do this. You know, I think the entire IBC ecosystem is evidence that people are comfortable with this, but it does not change the fact that, uh, you know, bad information from one chain just means you are pristinely communicating bad information. So now where it sits in the landscape, Hyperlane came out of us looking at the landscape and saying, what, what are, who's done it the best? And I think IBC is the best design, kind of bar none, most usable. It has its flaws, but by and large, best design. To the extent that IBC needs complementing or needs extending, I think it emerges from the fact that the thinking that led to the formation of IBC happened at a time where if you told me that your design for a blockchain was going to be the most dominant in the world, that was a very believable thing to say. Because 2015, 16, 17, even 18, it was not clear at all that Ethereum was going to be a dominant force as much as it is today, you know, insofar as the mind share that it has of just the, the crypto ecosystem. You know, back then, if you had said, no, Polkadot's going to be way bigger. No, Cosmos is going to be way bigger. That was a very reasonable thing to say. And IBC was brewed, same for XCMP. They were both brewed at the same time horizon. And so IBC was built for what I would call like defined rule set systems where it's like, you know, if you're a Tendermint chain, IBC is your best option. Don't even think about it, right? Like don't even bother. But if you look at the landscape of what's happening in crypto, majority of activity is not happening on Tendermint chains. And so what do we do then? We were sitting there, one of the uh, people behind IBC and a big, uh, you know, promoter and a uh, big force behind the growth of Tendermint chains and Zucky was a big part of how we designed Hyperlane. And, you know, my goal, and I think really our team's goal was to extend what we thought was the best design and say like, what trade-offs do we need to make? If what's the biggest fault with this thing as we see it is it's not extensible enough. It can't go anywhere. It's permissionless, but you're kind of blocked behind the fact that you have to be either a Tendermint chain or a Tendermint-like chain. You need fast finality and you need light line verification. And so we, with Hyperlane, mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure that we have a, like we are able to capture everything that IBC is. So you can have a module that gives you wherever applicable, you know, you can get the same guarantees as you get with IBC. Everywhere else, it's not just, you don't have to say, ah, well, shit, I'm out of luck. Okay, if I can't use something as pristine as IBC in these places, what can I use? And then can I have these other modules like the staking module, something more like, uh, you know, a trusted multisig, something more like those optimistic systems that we talked about. Uh, and so I'd say kind of closer to IBC with, you know, where we prioritized uh, extensibility as like the key key thing we wanted to focus on. Because to me, that's what it really means to be permissionless. Like, can I connect anything with it? Okay, okay. I'd like to bounce back to get back to the design of Hyperlane. So you have these validators and anyone can spin up the instance of the validator for their new chain, right? And you correct me if I'm wrong, but I can stake value on top of this validator mm -hmm. to indicate that I 
no, just pure game theory. Uh, if I do wrong, I should theoretically uh, end up being slashed if I try to to perform some malicious actions, and I have to stake my token of the protocol in the future. So you actually, I, so you can choose, you can choose um, which asset. So when you are setting up um, like a staking module with Hyperlink, you're defining the asset that validators should stake now. We think, and certainly a lot of the apps that use Hyperlane have asked for the ability for it to be their own token because they think that might uh, be a useful way in helping bootstrap their security and also their community. But there are others who want to use a larger token. They might, others want to use something like Ether or Atom. And so we, from, from the perspective of the staking module, it's kind of ambivalent about the asset that you want to use. It just says he, these addresses are validators and other people are delegating to them. Here is the asset that is being staked. And if they are found to, uh, to behave maliciously in hyperlink, this means they're signing something where there is no record on the chain of this thing that they're signing. Like if you, if you look at the, you know, look at the block history, you make a Merkle root of it. Like you're just, not, it's not going to match the Merkle root that they signed. Uh, and now you can provably show that they've committed some type of fraud as defined by the system. <laughs> And you can stack, uh, slash away their stake. Okay. So for a lot of bridges, we've seen some kind of liquidity provision, like liquidity mining programs, so that people have an actual incentive to lock their assets on contracts that can end up being exploited. We've seen that design. It's been pretty common within the, the bridge space. I, I just wanted to know how an ERC-20 would travel from chain A to chain B. Is there a need to actually lock it up on hyperlane or uh, you function in another way like what would be the the life cycle the journey of a given asset uh, with it under being wrapped um, three main ways there's a first way which just is very much like what you're familiar with other bridges which we certainly would not recommend anyone to do but because hyperlane <clears throat> allows you to do whatever you want with it it is certainly possible people can build a very traditional boring what I would call an omnibus bridge. An omnibus bridge is one where you have one contract that takes in all the deposits from all the people for all of the assets. And as you said before, I use the term honeypot. In my view, this creates a very effective honeypot because all of the assets from all of the people get deposited into the same contract. Uh, and you can do that with Hyperlink. I would not recommend it, but if you wanted to do that, we actually, no one can stop you from doing it. Terrible idea, but you certainly can do it. Then now we have the more Hyperlane native ways, which I think are the more interesting ones. Uh, in Hyperlane, we have this concept of what we call an interchain asset. What is an interchain asset? An interchain asset is one where when you create it, normally something like an ERC-20, it, it has a canonical home on the chain it was created. So historically, that's really only been Ethereum, but now many of the EVM chains just have ERC-20 replicas. So you can have, you know, you make an ERC-20 on Ethereum, and now if you wanted to transfer it using one of the bridges, it gets wrapped. So these interchain assets, when you create them, you define their homes. And it doesn't have like a, a standard place where it's home to. Rather, you say, hey, I am comfortable with it being transported between uh, these chains that have Hyperlane. Maybe it's my chain, it's, it's your chain, it's Ethereum, and it's Arbitrum. And once it's been created, when you want to move it from, uh, say, ETH to Arbitrum, from Arbitrum to, to your chain, the transfer function that exists in ERC-20s and, and similar assets, instead of just having a destination address, it also has a qualifier for the domain, or in this case, the chain that it's going to. So now you can easily transfer it between chains, or you can transfer it as easily between chains as you would on a single chain. Uh, and what actually happens in the background, well, that asset gets burned on the sending chain, and it gets reminted to the destination address on the destination chain. So for new assets, if you were going to create another asset today, and you wanted it to... to be able to move between chains, I would say actually just make it an interchain token. No one will ever have to wrap it. It'll be wonderful. And as time change, you want to add it to more chains, you can certainly do that. Now, all of this leads to the, the final main way that you can move assets around with Hyperlane is like, well, so this interchain asset sounds really cool if I was just starting over, but like, what if I have an already existing asset? What if I want to move around Ether? What if I want to move around USDC? What do I do? So for Hyperlane, we uh, designed what we call warp routes. These are like our take on bridging. And it's a way to move assets around 
that benefits from the unique design of hyperlink because if all we did was like that first method i talked about just use hyperlink to create a standard looking bridge you don't get to benefit from the fact that it's permissionless very much you don't get to benefit from the modular security architecture because everyone's assets are all in the same place uh, and all the assets have to be to go under like similar security models so in a warproud case a warproud is created on a per asset level so you'd have a warp route from say ethereum to your rollup for eth you'd have a different warp route for usdc and when you create that warp route, you define the chains that you want it to be connected to and all that's really happening is that the asset that's being deposited is wrapped in an interchain uh, asset like we just talked about before is minted so it's uh it's a way to turn the assets we talked about before, or sorry, to take existing assets and turn them into what we talked about before in the interchain asset format. So when you configure your warp route, you say, hey, I want to use these different security modules. I want to connect it uh, to chains A, B, and C, and, and you know, roll up D. And now they can fr the that wrapped asset can freely move between all of those places, and it works very much like the, not very much like it is an interchain token uh, after that wrapping mm -hmm. action is performed. Uh, and this is something that a lot of our rollup and chain users like to use because it's the easiest way for them to import new assets into their chain uh, while using a somewhat recognized system. So they can create the rollup and then, you know, an hour after they launched it, they're able to have people bridge in assets quickly in and out of their chain of rollup. Yeah, I mean, I like how all aspects of the interlane stack, you still have the choice. Uh, you can basically choose the approach that suits your needs best and with all the trade-offs that they might have or the advantages based on what business logic you're trying to build, what you're exactly trying to achieve. That's pretty interesting. And you just mentioned rollups. It seems that Hyperlane is coming up as one of the default solution to disenclave these rollups. Uh, I've been finding some of your some documentation explaining how to, you know, have your rollup that's that use Celestia SDA and can just like be disenclaved and actually communicate with other systems using Hyperlane. I found that that paper with uh, Eclipse, which has the um, yeah that that SVM kind of rollup. So it seems that Hyperlane is kind of coming up as one of the go-to solutions to to disenclave rollups. So I would like to know more about your agenda. To explain Hyperlane, I think anyone can just use Hyperlane to connect to other chains, but I'd love to know about your strategy when it comes to rollups and just like have some general words about the whole flow, the developer experience, should I decide myself to deploy Hyperlane on my system, even though it's pretty straightforward as you explained it many times. Of course. So I think, you know, there, so there is like the conscious, hey, we want, we are trying to pursue this world of, of modular blockchains and rollups. And that's certainly one part of it, and I'll get into that. But then there's the other where, um, if you think about like what folks like Eclipse are doing, they're making it easier for you to spin your own, your own rollup. What's Celestia doing? With Celestia's DA solution, it's now easier for you to spin roll, your own rollup. With what they've built, the, the framework that they've built, uh, it's called Rollkit. That too makes it much easier for you to create your own rollup. Then look at what Optimism is doing yeah, with the OP stack. All of, there's a unifying theme here, right? There's a lot of people whose work is culminating in, in it making it easier for you to create your own chain. And I, I like to use the term chain and rollup kind of indistinguishably because I think right now they, they, they look very much alike. And so there's a strength where the world of crypto is moving towards more, uh, instead of like a small number of these very large internet computers, we're making it easier for you to create your own smaller one. And in that world, like I, I just created my own role. It's kind of like, I just made a planet appear up in space, right back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the conversation. And cool, like, yeah, they just made it super easy for me. For like months ago, it would have taken me, you know, several weeks to get from zero to a hundred on, uh, on launching my own, my own rollup or chain. All these tools made it. Now I did it in an hour, but okay. So I launched it and then what, what do I do? Like, how do I, how does it connect to the other planetary systems? How does it uh, benefit from the existing ecosystem? How does it create routes for it to, you know, import activity and export activity back? into the other like populated and thriving places and the options that builders are faced with are build it on your own well like shit they got so much going on right like it's, it's hard enough uh to focus on like the app that they're trying to build the chain that they're trying to build now they have to figure out how to do this thing and their second option is one of the permission providers might want to add them 
So you'll go to them and like you said, it's either a governance process or it's a business development process. Sometimes it's a little bit of a little bit of both. Now, if you're a very well funded, you know, a lot of hype around you, you have nothing to worry about. You will be taken care of. But what if you are like the crypto equivalent of, you know, two guys in a garage? What do you do then? So you you hope that the, the the providers like accept what you're interested, what you're doing in, that are interested in you. And but like, what do you do if they're they just say no? And worse yet, what do you do if they just they don't even say anything? They just ignore you. They're like you are nobody. And so your third option then becomes you need something that you can that is permissionless that you can kind of use yourself. And Hyperlane is that thing. And I think that's why it's really resonated in the roll-up ecosystem as much as it has, because the, the roll-up ecosystem is all about kind of, uh, it's, it's going back to this, to the crypto roots of sovereignty, of permissionlessness, and a tool like Hyperlane that uh, the contracts are totally owned by the deployer, right? Like we don't own them, the deployer owns them. They can decide uh, how to manage them from the moment they're deployed. And you can get this functionality without having to convince you don't have to convince anyone on our right like you there are people so we just this morning we discovered uh yet another deployment that they never even talked to us they're already using it and like that's the best thing in the world where you're like people are just doing it and they're not having any problems and they're just running with uh on their own so it's like an existential thing that kind of just is about this permissionless design and why it's appealing to roll-ups and then there's been the conscious strategy on our end to just I very much believe in only building for a world in crypto where uh, demand has greatly expanded from where it is today. And I've been in crypto long enough to know that I think that can only be catered by two kind of variants of the world. Either we are going to have very successful monolithic designs and okay, that world is kind of like catered to and the interoperability in that world is I think well captured by our peers, the folks who have more permission systems. Because if there's only like 10 chains, it's not a problem to support that with like proper business development and governance. So the other side is there might be this modular world in which there's going to be hundreds of thousands of these smaller chains and business development could never ever scale to cover that, not in the time that it needs to. And so that's why, you know, strategically, we are much happier to focus in this region. And it's kind of, it's like, it's the world that we know best. It's the world that we're most, most comfortable in. And so it, it aligns like philosophically, it aligns with us just, you know, personality wise in our interests. And then there's a strategic alignment there. And as you know, you mentioned that there are more tools to abstract the complexity of launching your own rollup or blockchain, like Conduit, Altlayer, et cetera, et cetera. And a solution like Hyperlane would definitely fit very well as this solution becomes uh, become more production ready and available to everyone. Would it be possible to actually write your own mailbox contracts in a new language, in a new domain specific language? Because that ZK rollup, well, it has its own provable language and, and yeah, you have to deal with that. So would actually, as a community member, be able to write my own Hyperlane implementation? Not and, only can you, yeah. you, you can, and it's already been done. Okay. So you mentioned Eclipse earlier. Uh, our teams are ma major, major fans of the Eclipse team. And the way that our collaboration really started is Eclipse became aware of Hyperlane and Eclipse started working on implementing Hyperlane for the SVM, for the, the Solana yep. VMC level. And so pretty soon Hyperlane is going to be live on the first, um, first set of SVM rollups. And it is like 99% the work of the Eclipse team. And so this is just like a first example. Uh, just this week, I was made aware, because uh, they contacted us for the first time, of someone building Hyperlane for an environment I would have never thought of. I'm not going to name it because some people will get mad, but I think it's awesome that someone's doing it. It is a very controversial uh, chain that has a major following, and, and I'd say certainly a mercurial uh, founder who, you know, some people like, so others, I don't have an opinion on him. I just think the whole situation is funny, but I think it's the coolest thing in the world that someone else is like, I want to use this for this chain. And oh, what is, what's actually, what is the barriers? Well, the, the barrier is, you know, John said that I need to put the contracts on that chain. I need to run the relayer for that chain. Well, the contracts right now are being written, for, like they're already written for Solidity and uh, EVMs. They're basically done for uh, C-level and Solana VM, very close to being done for Cosmos SDK and Cosmwasm, and are basically done for the Fuel VM. 
So that covers several major environments. But what if I'm not covered there? What if I can just go ahead and I can do that? Someone just needs to do the work. But if you're the someone who does the work, like amazing. So that's one thing that we want to see more uh, kind of community contributions from. And another, and this is kind of like long-term, I think the most important part of opening up security to these different modules was not just that we'll continue to like innovate as, as you know, the Hyperlink core developers. No, I think there are much smarter people outside of our team and much better security researchers. And will they start kind of wrapping up their security innovations as Hyperlink security modules? And now we actually see a sort of like marketplace for security that comes not from us, but it almost looks more like, a, you know, the crypto version of an app store where people create different security modules, have different fee structures for using them. And I'm happy to say there's actually one, uh, one ZK team that's working on this right now. Okay. Now that's pretty exciting. I think that the last point that I would like to explore here is um, fee capture at the, the hyperlane level. So a lot of protocols, they have to have some kind of mechanism to, to accrue value and um, yeah, they need to be economically sound, so they're secure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about how people spinning up their own instance of Hyperlane would accrue value to Hyperlane. Are you taking the path of the Cosmos SDK where everyone can deploy their own chain and create their own like currency and auto token and, and figure it out? Yeah, I would just be very curious to know what would be the... Of course. I think, you know, we, we are lucky that we have the advantage of doing this in 2023, where we've seen what different uh, people in different ecosystems have done either successfully or attempted to do unsuccessfully or didn't attempt to do it all and then kind of let things roll and we can learn from that. So what I'll admit is some of these things are still figuring out and we're going to experiment with the different ideas. But the core thinking right now is we never want to stop anyone from just putting hyperlane wherever but what we do want to create is some um, some unified formation between the disparate parts of hyperlane so want to do two things first want to create great incentive for people to put hyperlane everywhere so again going back to space i want to create incentive for people to go out and kind of like colonize the galaxy colonize the interchain and put hyperlane on every every chain that's out there, whether it's your chain, someone else's chain. And so that's step one, is creating that incentive and, and, and you know flywheel system. And two is from that, can we create the reason people to unify and galvanize around some core, but do it in such a way where it makes sense for them. So there are two areas where you can see fees happening uh, with Hyperlink. The one that is already live today is in the relayer. The relayer because it handles this very important function of processing the transaction, and it also handles the um, gas management. So imagine like how unpleasant or how useless, really, I should say, how useless is a, a interoperability system for blockchains if it requires you to have the gas tokens of the place that you're sending to. That would stink, right? Like I'm sending from Ethereum to Cosmos, and I oh. Can't pro I guess I'm, I guess I need to already have atoms. Like that's that's no good. So the relayer performs this nice function for users. But how does it do that? Well, it needs to maintain an inventory. And so in that sense, like it's taking on some risk. So the relayer gets to define its fees. And some people will say, okay, I don't want to use this. This relayer is expensive. No thanks. And uh, some people will actually run the relayer for free because maybe they want to subsidize the service for their users. And so right now, people who run Hyperlane, they will be able to charge fees through the relayer, but not everyone wants to run relayers. And so one thing uh, the core team at Hyperlane is working on is creating relayer services. And so yes, it should always be uh, an option that you can run Hyperlane all on your own, but if you don't want to, the same way that like, yeah, anyone who creates an app can have, uh, you know, bare metal servers in their house or somewhere like in their office. But a lot of people opt to use cloud services. And so I'd like to think of the relayer service as a way to derive value that again, looks, it's optional. People could use it to have an easier time getting started and reduce their operational burden, but they're paying for it because it's a service and it's a valuable service and you like to pay for valuable services. Uh, beyond that, we've also kind of kicked around the idea of uh, perhaps fees for the different security modules. Because again, if we want to create 
uh, you know, like a, a marketplace, you have to give people a reason. So same way that like, oh, why do app developers create apps for the app store? Well, because there's a robust market there and the app store kind of acts like this distribution channel that then you can create a product. And the app store is very generalized. The products are very general. Well, in, in crypto, if we do transition to this multi-chain world with thousands of rollups, security is going to become increasingly important because every action becomes an interchain action. And so there, I think there can develop a very robust market for uh, security. And I would much rather try and benefit from the best minds in the world that all, ex you know, just by sheer numbers, there are more, more of them outside of the Hyperlink core, uh, you know, core contributors than there are inside. And so hopefully that marketplace becomes a real thing. And uh, people put forth different security modules, users pay per use or apps pay per use. And some of that goes back together to uh, to a hyperlink down or so. But again, still, I'd say very early in the, that these designs are certainly not set in stone. From what you've told me, I'm pretty new to hyperlink, but I really like how you're not trying to prescribe things to your potential users. And I think that's a great way to attract smart people by having an experience that offers liberty, like the freedom to do things the way you want them, at all aspects, at all steps of the process of deploying your own hyperlane contract. I think that's great. But at the same time, you need to find mechanisms to capture value, which are not invasive and which sure. respect the user freedom. It's a, it's a very complex problem that you've introduced here. And um, I'm, I'm sure that you guys will find a great solution. Yeah. But yeah, I have a lot of respect for what you're trying to do here because it's not easy. I think. No, it's not easy at all. I think, you know, we're, we're trying to handle this balance of, you know, you want to have a nice default bias and you want, so I kind of want Typeland to be a little bit like, like a restaurant that specializes in a small number of dishes and like it has a menu and the menu has like, you know, two to five items and they're all really, really good items. But at the same time, this is a type of restaurant where like it has an open kitchen. And if you like, you know, if you really know what you want to make, you can walk into that kitchen and you can use their ingredients. You can use their stoves. You can use their knives. You can use all of their like high-end equipment, right? So in that sense, like the the open source hyperlink software is kind of like the equipment in the restaurant, like the ingredients in the restaurant. And you can use it to make whatever you want. And in that case, you pay a very, very different price, right? Because like the chef isn't making your meals. Like you're just, you know, you're, you're being the chef for a bit. And I don't, yeah, I don't think it'll be easy. Uh, I think it's important, like you said, to kind of respect the developer, not be too prescriptive. At the same time, a lot of people do just want to go in and they just want to order like something simple. Like they don't want to think about how to make the burger. They don't want to think about like, oh, you know, they love that cut of filet mignon that they get somewhere. They don't want to think about how to make it. They just want to come in. They want to say, I want a filet mignon. I want a medium. Get it ready for me. And so I think it's imperative that that is available to you. And I want us to be like, you know, when you, sometimes you visit, you know, like a, a website or like a uh, apps documentation. And they have a really nice, clean intro page. But then when you want to learn more, you just click on the side menu and now you can go as deep as you want to. And I want Hyperlink to kind of be like that, where you can get a lot out of it if you're just, you know, knowledge-wise, just dipping your toes. But you can get a world out of it if you want to dive real, real deep. Uh, it's going to require more work, but it's not, uh, you're not confined to only going, you know, uh, a thousand foot deep. Like you can go a little deep, get some of the defaults, or you can go as, as deep as you want to and then kind of build your own world with it. Yeah, that's cool. I Speaking of building your own world, what would be the best way to engage with Hyperlane if I have a question that I want to ask to the Hyperlane development team or, uh, yeah, I want to try building something using the Hyperlane stack. I have some questions. What would be the go-to path? Is there a Discord, uh, some, some forums that I'm I should check. And since we are on a podcast that, that caters, that is like for a French audience, uh, I'll be curious to know if you guys will have some presence in ETC next month. Absolutely. Like so starting yeah. from the end, because I like to do that with your questions, uh, we will be at ETC. <laughs> we'll be there in full force. It is my favorite event. I love Paris. We also have uh, at least one team member who will be joining us who is uh, who's a, who's a native. <laughs> and I'll be very happy to have her show us around because it's the first time I'll be in Paris with a native. So we're super excited for. So definitely come meet us at ETCC. We'll also be at the ETH Global Hackathon at ETCC. We love doing ETH Global events. So please, uh, please come on by. I'll be at that booth the entire weekend. Now to the fun stuff. You want to learn more about Hyperlink? You have any questions? 
come to our Discord. Uh, you can join it, but it's discord.gg slash hyperlane. You can also find it on our Twitter. That's uh, at hyperlane underscore XYZ. So a lot of teams in crypto, they use Slack for their own communication and they use Discord for like their community. We don't do that. We use Discord too. And we're maniacal about Discord. So like you come to the Discord, you have a question, you drop it in the developer channel, you'll get a response pretty quickly because we that's where we live, right? Like it's where we talk to each other. It's a core team's communication all happens in the same place. That way there is no, you know, us versus them that happens with some teams who use another platform like Slack. You'll also find help from a lot of other people who have been building with Hyperlane. So it's my favorite thing to see when like I ask, so I'm like, why isn't, why is no one answering this developer? And like, then you see that another Hyperlane builder is answering them. That's, that's my favorite thing to say. <laughs> That's super cool. And I'll make sure to leave all the relevant links in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section too. And yeah, I, I'll i be seeing you, I guess, in ETCC. And uh, it was very nice having you on the podcast. I'm sure that I'll get to do some kind of checkpoint in, in six or nine months to see how the whole stack has evolved and discuss some, some other exciting things. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, John, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. It was a pleasure.